We are delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by the tall Banega Swast India. It is our pleasure to present today, Better to Have Gone, Love and Death in Orwell, Akash Kapoor in conversation with Mukund Padmanabhan. Journalist and writer Akash Kapoor's book on the intentional community of Oroville, an international township of thousands located in South India, is at once a haunting personal quest and an erudite study into the history of utopias. Better to have gone, love, death, and the quest for utopia unravels a personal tragedy, the mysterious death of John Walker and Diane Mines, parents to Kapoor's wife, Oroville. Kapoor returns to Oroville, where both he and his wife were raised, and in confronting the ghosts of those distant deaths, reveals an astonishing history of faith, idealism, extremism, and the quest for perfectionism. In conversation with author Mukund Padmanabhan, Kapoor discusses Oroville, the opportunities and perils of utopia, and the nature of memory and personal grief, and how they intersect history. Akash Kapoor. Akash Kapoor is the author of India Becoming, A Portrait of Life in Modern India, and Better to Have Gone, Love, Death, and Quest for Utopia, which was selected by the New York Times as a notable book of 2021, and by the New Statesman as the book of the year. Kapoor is the former Letter from India columnist for the New York Times, and he writes regularly for the New Yorker, the Wall Street Journal, and other publications. He's a senior fellow at the GovLab, at NYU and a founding member of the Academic Advisory Board for Korea University. Mukund Padmanabhan. Mukund Padmanabhan is a professor of public practice at the newly established Korea University, north of Chennai, where he teaches philosophy. He spent most of his working years in journalism, retiring as editor of the Hindu in 2019. Prior to this, he was the editor of the Hindu Business Line, a sister publication from the same group. Padmanabhan is an MPhil in philosophy and worked briefly as lecturer at the University of Delhi before switching to journalism. He's interested in and has written about politics, legal affairs, and literature. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Lit Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, better to have gone, love and death in Oroville. Akash Kapoor in conversation with Mukund Padmanabhan. Mukund, over to you. Yeah, so Akash Kapoor's Better to Have Gone is a book that weaves two narrative strands together. One is an investigation into the mysterious deaths of John Walker and Diane Mays, the parents of Akash Kapoor's wife, Aurelis. They pass away in 1986 in perplexing circumstances within hours of each other in Oroville, the experimental township near Pondicherry that manifested in the mind of the mother, Sri Aurobindo's foremost disciple. This personal story, which is a cathartic excavation of buried family truths, is the foundation for a larger narrative that arguably un unravels even larger truths about Oroville. Akash discovers that the tragic fates of John and Diane are inextricably twinned with the social history of Oroville, uh, which at that time uh, is a story of a community that was driven with conflict, uh, confronted by extremist views, the story of a place that was not quite the utopia it was meant to be, a place in Akash's words that walked to the edge of the precipice and back. Um, so thank you, Akash. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to begin with a very general question. Um, you came across some papers when you were shuffling through a drawer in New York, and it contained material that seeded and prepared the ground for the book. May I just begin by requesting you to talk about this accidental discovery, because in many ways, it sets the context for the birth and evolution of the book. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for that introduction, uh, Mukund. So, yeah, I mean, I had, this was a period where I had finished my previous book, India Becoming, and I was sort of casting about trying to figure out what I would write next. And um, I was in the apartment of my, my in-laws, 
who were my wife's adoptive parents in New York. And I was sort of fiddling around in their drawers. I don't know why. And I came across this, this uh, green folder stuffed with papers and stuffed with letters. And I started reading it. And yes, it turned out that this was the correspondence and the diaries that they had saved um, from <clears throat> somebody I had, I had vaguely known in Oracle as a child who was my, my uh, wife's adoptive father and who is in, in many ways at the core of this book, John Walker. And I started reading these letters just you know, out, of, out of curiosity. And it was, it was just this incredibly powerful experience, partly because John Walker's voice is so lyrical and evocative and he's such a wonderful writer. And, and, I, and I think that comes through some of the reviews commented on it in, in the book, because I quote him at length, uh, but also because it didn't just introduce me to John, whom I had only known as a child and peripherally, but through these letters, I was also brought back to the Orville of my childhood. I mean, I had grown up in Orville, I had lived through the years and the times that he was describing and so it just opened up these worlds to me. Uh, and gradually, you know, I realized that I want, to, I want to write about John. And then the more I read John's letters, I realized, well, in order to write about John, I need to be writing about Orville in this time. And then the book just kept expanding in scope that way. And you, you refer to a time when Orville was so somewhat bitterly divided between the so-called revolutionaries who claimed to represent the true spiritual legacy of the mother and Sri Aurobindo and the much more moderate neutrals uh, who were disparaged for allegedly betraying this legacy and even commercializing the mother's dream and so on. How much of this was a real ideological battle and how much of this was a power game? It's a good question. And, you know, and, and the divides were not just along those lines. I mean, the community was really riven in, in, in many different ways. So, you know, the, it, it started as a conflict with the caretakers in Pondicherry whom had been tasked by, by the mother to actually oversee Oroville um, and then there was a sense among the population, a certain segment of the population in Oroville that they were being remotely managed and that they wanted to manage their own affairs. And so this was this was the first divide. And, and, and that was a, both an ideological divide and a divide over authority and power. And then within Oroville, you had further divides, as you as you say, because there were some people who, who became known as the neutrals who, you know, wanted to sort of follow a more moderate path of conciliation with with the people in Pondicherry. Uh, and so they were, many of them were sort of excommunicated or, 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 or ostracized by the community in Oroville. Um, so as with many things in, 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 in these sort of ideological or idealistic towns, it's often a mix, you know, it's a mix of idealism. It's a mix of sort of noble impulse and, and believe in the, belief in the truth with baser kind of human impulses and human emotions having to do with power and ego and envy and, 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 and sort of, yeah, desire for authority and control. Yeah, uh, you refer to idealism and, you know, uh, some kind of idealized vision of perfect society or a utopia is fine. But I think the problem is, as we've seen time and again, uh, is when we try to make this vision a reality. Uh, we know that history is littered with failed utopian experiments. Given this, do you think that a certain dystopic character was built into the Oroville experiment from the very beginning, that what happened afterwards in a way was inevitable? I think, you know, I wrote an article on Utopia a few years ago where I referred to dystopia as Utopia's evil twin. And I think that I think that they do often come together. Um, and I think, you know, there, there are reasons for that. One is that, I mean, you, you, utopian societies or these idealistic societies by their nature attract um, what you might generously characterize as very true believers, right? And you might less generously characterize them as extremist believers. And I think anytime extremism enters the picture, um, yeah, it can lead to some very dark places. I think it's, I think it's difficult, you know, and, and I try to maintain a balance in the book because at the same time, idealism is a very narrow, uh, a, a very noble impulse, of course, and, and it leads to many wonderful things. Um, and so there's this kind, constant kind of seesaw between the light and the darkness of idealism um, and, and trying, you know, a community and then individuals trying to figure out how far to push their idealistic impulses, how to avoid straying into a kind of rigid extremism that ends up being destructive rather than constructive. Um, and I just, I, I see that when, you know, in some ways this book was so, almost like a history of Orville and, and I just see this tussle playing out over time um, and, it, and it continues in communities like Orville around the world. Yeah, I mean, in that prevailing climate that you describe of slander and threats and so on, uh, you recall re two really disturbing incidents. One of them is when people pulled out books uh, from shelves of li the library 
and watch them burn in a bonfire. Uh, the other is when schools were ordered to close so that children could ostensibly be uh, liberated from them. Uh, I mean, within the community now, uh, you know, it's it's changed and I recognize that it's not what it was in the 70s and 80s. Um, how much of a sense of regret is there uh, within the community now about what took place? Is, or are they conscious of their past? So I, I mean, I was going to head in that direction. I think that there's a, uh, I, I don't want to say a consensus, but I think that there's many, many people who who look back on that period and realize that, you know, the community kind of tipped over the edge. And you have to also realize that, you know, it's it's many years later. And so many of the people who were involved in that, who even at that time were kind of quite a small faction, aren't around anymore. They've left Oroville, they've passed away. And so there's been a kind of regeneration of the population. And so I would say that those events I mean, they're almost like part of Orville's distant mythological past. And so one of the one of the things, you know, that, that happened when I wrote this book is I was reconstructing history for a lot of people who had heard sort of had heard these stories sporadically and without context and kind of in an isolated way. And uh, I was, you know, I was nervous about the, the, the reaction that some of these people would have uh, to the book. And, and yes, some people had fairly negative reactions to the book. But I would say, by and large, the, the reaction I got was actually people writing to me and saying, Thank you for reconstituting this history because we had heard these stories and we didn't really know what had happened and we didn't understand the context of it. And you know, history is a continuum, right? History is not a series of isolated incidents. Um, and so, you know, part, when you write a history, you're partly trying to sort of set up what sets the stage for for these types of events. Um, and I think that was help. It was certainly helpful for me to understand that. And I think some of the readers also found that helpful. Well, I mean, you've just answered my next question, with, which was, you know, it's got a lot of praise and quite deservedly, uh, both in India and abroad. And I was wondering about what the reaction was in Oroville was. And I think if by and large people have reacted uh, positively, or at least they haven't been very upset about it, uh, then you've, you know, you've struck the right notes because it's critical, but it's critical in a sort of uh, gentle and empathetic way. Uh, is that what the kind of tone you wanted to take? Yeah, I mean, I would say I would, you know, I'm not sure that I would I would characterize it as I have struck the right notes. I mean, I, I would also say that this says something very positive about the community, right? Because I was certainly, I was nervous heading into it about how the community would react. And, and I was, you know, warned by other writers like, oh, you know, uh, small idealistic communities don't generally respond well to, to books that aren't sort of uh, you know, for, for lack of a better word, hagiographies about the community. Um, but no, I mean, th there, you know, I did get a couple very upset emails and, and, and there are some notable silences, but, but generally the response has been not, not even just positive because that would be simplistic. Even people who don't agree with my conclusions are able to understand the project and are able to respect the, the sort of the fact that I have a different view of things and, and, and that other people in the community have a different point of view. And actually, to me, this is so heartening, not because uh, it means that as an author, you know, I was I was well treated or whatever, but because it means that the, the, the community is receptive and open to kind of, you know, constructive sort of thinking about about itself and what it's done. And so sometimes, you know, in, in the media coverage, like especially in the US, people would say like, oh, you know, is Oroville a cult? And, and this is my answer to that. I said, well, look, I wrote this book. I'm an Orvillian. I wrote this book. I'm still very much a member of the community. I have a lot of friends. People treat me warmly. And that's not how cults treat people. And so, you know, that, that this feels to me like a, like a great sort of like a rejoinder to that question. You know, I couldn't help thinking about another book while I was reading yours, which is very different in, in, in terms of tone and outlook. And this is uh, Peter Washington's Madame Blavatsky's Baboon, uh, which is a kind of no holds barred takedown of the Theosophists, a movement, again, also founded mainly by white people, which also drew heavily on Indian spiritual and philosophical traditions. One that was headquartered in Madras, not so far from Oroville and Pondicherry. Um, and that book uh, exposed the irrationalities and the bizarre beliefs of theosophists in a sort of harsh and, and satirical way. Uh, but your treatment of those who held irrational theories in Oroville, um, including those about immortality and cellular transformation and the like, um, is almost non-judgmental in, in comparison. Um, and despite the fact that you describe yourself in the book as someone who's you know, closer to the side of reason, um, was this 
a result of your being an insider, uh, that you grew up in an environment that you knew these people, uh, even if you disagreed with them. And so you were able to see sides of their character and personalities that an outsider may not have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the, the way I describe myself in the book is somebody who's closer to the side of the reason, but who respects faith and admires faith and, and almost sort of aspires toward it, even if I say I've never quite reached it myself. So, um, yeah, I was, I was treading a fine line, you know, it's something that, I, and, and there was a certain amount of personal questing going on in my own mind, where I'm trying to understand certain impulses that I have a hard time understanding because of my constitutional or intellectual makeup, or maybe because of my education. And yet I've also seen some of the, some of the nobler sides of, 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 the, of these beliefs and of this faith, and I, and I respect it. And I admire it, even while um, seeing at the same time that it can be destructive, that it can tip over the edge. Um, so I, I was treading a fine line. I was, I was, I was trying to be critical where criticism was due, but I was also trying to, to show respect and, and, and admire where, where that is deserved. And I, I know that other book you referred to. I mean, I read it a long time ago. This was a very different project. Like there are many, many books out there that are, you know, takedowns of communities and takedowns of, of faith. And and fine. I mean, that that wasn't this wasn't the project, right? This was. This was more, um, I think one of the reviews referred to it as like a sort of a native son's take on, on the community. Uh, and, I, and I am a native son of Orville and, and, I, and I love the community and I admire it and I think it's done wonderful things and it's full of incredibly idealistic people who have devoted you know, decades of their lives to, to, to building this community and to, and to building wonderful things. Um, yeah, so it's interesting that you didn't say in the book that you were on the side of reason, that, but you say that it's closer to the side of reason. Uh, which yeah, because I, dis- because me I, to- I discuss it, sorry, because I, I think I, I, I quote Thomas Merton at some point who, who discusses, a sort of, discusses it as a road that leads from reason to faith. You know, again, it's, it's a kind of continuum and I say that everybody so, is placed somewhere on that spectrum. So the book did lead you to interrogate or reinterrogate faith. Um, uh, what is that kind of uh, interrogation? What is the result? Well, is it, have you got closer to faith? Or? Yeah, I mean, if anything, if anything, it's a strange thing because the book is full of, is littered with, with stories of, of sort of the bad places that faith leads to, both at a social level and an individual level. Um, and I, I think I really surprised myself by, I mean, I started off the book much more skeptical than I ended the book. And I sort of find myself admiring some of the faith and idealism by the end of the book, much more than I did when I started the project. And this, by the way, is not just about Orville. This is also about the, the, the lead characters in the book, you know, who my, my in-laws essentially, who, who end up dying because of their faith. Um, and yet there is such a nobility and such an integrity to their quest. Um, so I found myself admiring it even while recognizing that, that it had, you know, calamitous consequences. Yeah, that was my next question. I mean, was it? difficult to write empathetically about ideas that actually had a bearing on on the health and eventually the life of your wife's parents i mean wasn't that a difficult thing to do yes it was it was it was a difficult project in in many ways i mean fortunately when you're writing a book you're often so obsessed with the technical difficulties that you tend to like not even notice the the larger sort of difficulties till later um, but of, yes, it was it was difficult, and I'm writing about events in my in my wife's life that were extremely painful, and so I'm navigating her feelings about them. You know, in 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 the sort of you know decades later, um, my look, there were some ideas that that people took way too far, and they ended up in a very bad place. On the other hand, I saw that these these people who were on this quest that ended in a bad place had more meaning and more sort of cohesiveness in their lives during those moments than they had at any other time in their lives. So, and, and secondly, that they, they made these decisions out of free will. I mean, nobody coerced them into making these decisions. These were, these were sort of choices that they made. Um, and it's a little, you know, that I, I read about euthanasia, for example, while I was reading the book, because these are, these are decisions that individuals make. And I'm not saying that like, nobody should have stepped in or that they, these were necessarily the right decisions, but I think that we need to sort of respect the agency of the people who made the decisions uh, and understand why they made them and understand that as dark as they were, it also inspired them in many ways and give, gave their life meaning. So uh, in other words, uh, you could put yourself into their skin and understood why they allowed themselves to die. Um, 
That's, I mean, I read I, their letters and I read I read their letters and I read their diaries and I heard the tone in their in their voices. And sometimes they sounded a little bonkers, to be honest. They really did. But at other times they sounded very lucid and and you know, very, very just sort of this was this was what they wanted to do with their lives. This was the choice they had made with their lives. Um, look, the title of the book is is better to have gone. Um, and, and it comes from a letter that, you know, John's father wrote to him uh, about about the fact that he had left his privilege in America and moved to India. And he says something like, you know, it was better to have gone on this quest and this pilgrimage than to have than to have stayed here. Probably it should have had a question mark after it. Um, but, you know, because John dies, John ends up dying because of this this quest. Um, and so that that's sort of where I leave it. So, um... How did your wife feel about, you know, uh, digging up <laughs> these stories about the past? Was she <laughs> disturbed by it at certain times or at the end of it was the effect cathartic and overall um, positive yeah. for her? Yeah, I mean, this is a question that that uh, everybody asks and it's and it's fair. And um, it was it was a process, I would say, you know, so it's not like a single moment or a single decision. You you discover these letters, you start thinking that maybe you'll write this book, you, you sort of talk about it. Is this something we want to do? You push along a little bit. And so every step of the way, we'd sort of like interrogate and question the project. And, and you're unraveling dimensions of this tragedy in her past that, you know, essentially of her parents having died when she was 14 years old. You're, you're in, in very un unfortunate circumstances. You're, you're uncovering aspects of this tragedy every step of the way and every step of the way you're saying, do we want to go deeper into this? Like, can we actually go deeper into this? And the truth is that, um, you know, in many ways it was very difficult. It was painful. Uh, and in other ways it was, as you say, cathartic because she, like the community had never quite understood the circumstances of those deaths. And, and after they died, she was adopted by John's sister. She moved to New York. And this was all sort of some foggy myth in Orville's history in her own mind. And people had, people around her had layered all kinds of symbolism and meaning on, onto it and, you know, or, or, or quote unquote meaning onto it. Um, and so I think in some ways getting to what had actually happened and shining a light on it was, was, was very powerful and, and very cathartic. While of course being, being painful at the same time. You know, another thing that, that, that happens that's strange is when, as an author, when you're working on a project like this, some of these people who are very real people and who are family members, they start becoming kind of characters in your mind. And so you're, you're navigating that sort of abstraction of these people you're writing about and that you're trying to reconstitute from the past with the flesh and blood reality uh, that your wife knew and of the fact that they're, you know, they're, they're actually parents and family members. So, I mean, given the fact that you did so many oral interviews, uh, there must, there must've been many characters in your book who, you've reassessed and, and uh, you know, who struck you as being more important in the history of Orville than you possibly thought they were, mm -hmm. uh, include, including one particular gentleman who spent a lot of time discuss, discussing or then moves to Kotegiri finally and, uh, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, so was there, were there many stories like this that you uh, discussed? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that, uh, particular gentleman, Satprem, who, whom you're referring to, um, he, he, you know, he's no longer alive, but I mean, and I yeah. certainly had a sense growing up as a child of the central role that he played in, uh, in, in Orville's history, but I think I didn't quite understand how central that role was. And, and I, I, I definitely, I see now that, I mean, his role was absolutely pivotal in Orville's history for better and for worse. Um, and, and I think his, you know, his, his role is st still remains highly controversial. And uh, we were referring earlier to the, to the reception to the book, to the extent that, that I have received angry notes and people have been upset with me, it was about his role. It was, it was a right. remaining contention over, over his role and my interpretation of his role. So certainly, you know, I, I, I reassessed or recalibrated my understanding of, of his, his role in Orville's history. And then there were many people who were still alive that I had grown up with. Um, and it's, you know, it's very interesting because you know these people intimately at a very sort of personal level. They're like almost like uncle-like figures. Some of them are, are, have been teachers along the way. Um, and then when you, but when you're writing a book, you kind of step back and you approach them through a film or through, through a, a layer where you drop your own prejudices or your preconceptions and you just try to listen to their stories and hear events from their point of view. 
And that was actually kind of wonderful. I mean, it was sort of wonderful because, you know, one of the problems with a, a community like, like Oroville is it's, it's, it's very noble. It has all this idealism and all of that, but it's also a little village and everybody knows each other too well. And there's too much personal history and everybody's sort of intertwined on this personal history. And it's quite wonderful to, to approach some of these people having dropped that history and having dropped those preconceptions and just being open to their point of view and their story. And I think that in some ways I got closer to some people that I, I formed new relationships and new friendships uh, with, with people that I had known all my life. Well, I mean, Orville has changed vastly, right? From the early years, the years of the forecomers, people lived in thatched huts, uh, there was a place without electricity, a place where the work was hard, life was extremely simple. Uh, today, it seems like a place, at least to the outsider, uh, where people are more or less well off, live in comfortable houses, some live abroad, uh, use Oroville as a second home, they run businesses, and so on. Um, so while the extremist fervor has dimmed, uh, hasn't a lot of the early youthful kind of idealism died with it, out with this as well? It's 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 a, it's a good question. It's it's always a matter of debate within the community. I mean, I think that these types of communities they almost have like human lifespans, you know. And and those were the teenage years back in the seventies. Those were the teenage years of of sort of unbridled idealism combined with the extremist, not always extremely well thought out views. Um, and now I suppose the community is a little bit more middle aged, uh, for better and for worse. I mean, yes, some of the some of the early ideological fervor has definitely uh, died out and people lament that and people miss that and they miss that kind of burning sense of, of idealism and commitment. On the other hand, I mean, this book that I wrote is a testament to the dangers of that kind of unbridled idealism. Um, and so I think in some ways the community is, is more um, rational, more calm. Um, and, you know, and I, I say in the book, I say that growing up in utopia is a great way to make you an incrementalist. And so if you, while revolutionary change and the revolutionary impulse is appealing and it's exciting, particularly if you're young, um, I think incrementalism is often a better way to get things done and certainly a less harmful or destructive way to get things done. It leaves fewer kind of, you know, corpses along, along the roadside. I mean, I, 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 I completely uh, agree with that. Uh, but, you know, you use the word middle-aged and you've talked of incremental, incrementalism. They both suggest a kind of a maturing, if you like, from that extremist uh, fervor, that early, perhaps, uh, un, un, you know, extreme youthful idealism. Um, but, uh, I mean, is there a case for thinking that uh, it's also got perhaps a little flabby? I mean, the people are living not very different lives from other people, say, outside Ottawa. Is there still a sense of idealism that exists in an important way um, today? Uh, and, and if so, where does it lie? Does it lie in the commitment to the environment or, or where exactly does this lie? Yeah, there's certainly a case to be made that it's gotten flabby. I mean, as you and I know, that happens with middle age, right? <laughs> you know, it's, part of, it's part of what happens. So there's certainly a case to be made for that. Um, I would make the case that, there, I mean, so I would say two things. I would say Orville is not a homogenous entity and some people are flabbier than others, right? I mean, it's, it's a complicated community. It's not, you know, there's a tendency and maybe this is writing as an insider, I see this more, but there's a tendency to sort of homogenize these communities and, and, and there is no single Oravillian identity. There's many, many strands in the community and they're different people. And, and, you know, you were referring earlier to the way people live. Some people, by the way, still live in huts. They still live on the land and they still live in huts much the, the way the early settlers did. Many don't, right? They live in, in, in the houses that, that people see, the sort of bigger houses. I think that there still is idealism uh, in Oroville. And, and I do think that if I had to point to where it lay, I would say that, you know, a lot of it lays in, in the amazing sort of ecological restoration work and the green work that, that has been going on there for 50 some years and that continues and that I think is probably more relevant today than, than it ever was given the, given the state of the planet and given the state of the environment and the country as a whole. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the really remarkable things about this green work is that it wasn't really part of the original plan. I mean, you know, utopias are planned and they have all these sort of ideas about what's gonna happen and often those plans don't pan out uh, the green work just grew out of necessity. It was a sort of pragmatic response to the harsh conditions of the land. And yet in some ways, I would say it's, it's Oroville's most remarkable legacy. 
Um, it's a contentious legacy within the community. Some people, you know, dispute it. But I think that in, in terms of concrete achievements that the community has, has sort of, you know, achieved over the last half century or so, pretty indisputably, that's, that's what it's done. It's one of the most successful reforestation projects in the country, if not in the world. Right. Um, which, you know, brings me to uh, this recent controversy over the master plan, which has once again exposed uh, the divisions between those who want the mother's vision to be implemented to the letter and those who think it could be modified uh, to perhaps prevent greater da damage to the environment, you know, less trees are felled, maybe you could move a road a little bit and so on. Uh, so in December last year, uh, trees were felled, a youth center was demolished, parts of a circular ring road were laid. Uh, I remember John Walker uh, in the book saying that uh, uh, he was pretty much on the side of uh, what he calls the organicists, I think, uh, you know, a community that grows organically and naturally. Um, I imagine um, your sympathies lie there as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, one of the interesting things about this debate that has recently, you know, sort of made its way into the media and risen to the fore is that when I was researching this book, I realized this debate has existed from the very beginning. So as you're, refer you're referring to John writing this letter, this is in the, you know, late 60s, early 70s. I mean, this goes back all the way there where there's a kind of dispute between the planned city and the kind of, you know, at that time it was a very modernist vision. I mean, it was the era of Chandigarh and, and, and Brasilia and places like that. And so in some ways, Oroville grew out of that impulse in that moment and you had this planned city and then you had the people living on the land who are actually planting the land who are sort of trying to build a city in a more organic way so this dispute has always existed it's cut through the community it's true that it's resurfaced in a very um in a very unfortunate way now recently and i think it's you know it's very disheartening to see the dispute to, to those of us who, who care about the community and for those of us who live in the community um i guess like the the, the thing i would say i mean i you know, you ask where my sympathies lie. My sympathies lie against extremism. That's that's sort of the thing that comes out of this book. And to the extent that either side is extremist, I I just don't buy that. And I think that I think what's lacking here is not so much the question is not so much. It's not for me to answer or for any individual to answer which vision of Oroville should be fulfilled. What you need in a community, especially as it gets bigger, is you need a decision making system. And you need, you know, these types of differences of opinion are inevitable, particularly in a community that by its nature attracts people with very strong opinions and very sort of strong views. And so you need some kind of dispute resolution system. You need a kind of system at a community level, call it democracy, or maybe Oravillians reject democracy, but you need a way to resolve these differences and arrive at, if not consensus, but solutions that are accepted. And, and that have legitimacy because they were they were achieved through this kind of process. And I think actually it's one of Oroville's greatest failings and sort of what, what it lacks the most in that in 53 years, it hasn't been able to develop this kind of governance framework that would arrive the community to resolve its differences. And that worries me and bodes more ill for the future in my opinion than any specific debate over uh, you know, the manifestation, a specific manifestation of the city or the master plan. How do you look at the future of Oroville, say, over the next two decades, three decades. Uh, are you hopeful? Um, if so, where do those uh, reasons lie for that hope? Uh, do you despair about something? If so, why? On yeah. what count? Well, the caveat to all of that is I'm generally a very pessimistic person. So let's, 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 let's caveat it with that. Let's also caveat it by saying that the general condition of the world seems pretty poor these days, and Oroville despite what some of us might believe is not a bubble, it's connected to the world. So I don't know, you know, if you had asked me this question a year or two ago, I might have been much more optimistic and I might have been much more hopeful. And I still believe that there are wonderful things in Oroville that, that can manifest. And I think that in, in many ways, uh, Oroville has, has a lot to teach the world, again, particularly on this, this green work front. And in fact, some of the, some of the green work that, that has been done in Oroville has been, it, it has been applied, you know, particularly in Chennai and in other parts of India. Uh, and, I, and I think that there's like wonderful lessons there that could sort of emanate out from Oroville in the way that many Orovillians have always dreamed of. At the same time, as you alluded to, there has been a lot of conflict recently. There's a lot of division within the community. It's, it's pretty disheartening. And I'm and I'm not sure I'm not sure how one finds one's way you know as a community out of that, and but you know this is the condition of the world right like this is happening at at, at in nations this is happening in communities 
And many of the forces that you see playing out at sort of like grand political levels across the world, like misinformation, social media, all this kind of stuff is happening in Orville too. And, and in some ways it's been, it's been very eye-opening to me to see how these sort of like big political themes can play out at, at such a small micro level in a community. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I would say it's like the fate of Orville is in many ways the fate of the world. And if we as like a species can resolve some of our differences and figure a way forward it'll 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 be beneficial not only to countries and continents but to but to small towns and idealistic communities around the world um we're living through dark times as we know we're living through very unstable sort of disheartening times um you could say that you know a, a vision for utopia for sort of idealism is more needed now than ever i don't know Right. Um, you have two books now under your belt. Um, I was just wondering um, if you've ever compared the reactions to both books. Were they very different? Um, were they pretty much the same? Did this book receive much more notice than the previous one? How would you, I mean? Yeah, I mean, they were very different books. You know, the last book was about India. So it was about a much larger, more recognizable entity. Um, I mean, I think this book received more attention and more, for lack of a better word, you know, critical praise or, or whatever. And I, I don't know why. I mean, you know, maybe it was the moment. Maybe people are more interested in kind of utopia. Maybe maybe I did a better job of it. Maybe there were many books about India that came out at the same time. Um, so I don't know. As, as a writer, I guess you try not to think too much about that. And, and you, you know, my abiding feeling about this book is I'm just so relieved it's done, right? Like people like, how do you feel about the book? So I'm just so glad it's done because it took so long and it was so much work. Um, and, and there are moments when you're in it where you, you can't quite believe that you will ever have a life again, where you're not waking up every morning and just thinking about like the problems you've got to work through and wondering, and, and, and they seem so innumerable. So, I mean, I'm not the only writer who, who, who says this, you know, and then you, then you just, you're so, you're so happy. And I read this great quote by uh, Thomas Mann recently, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than other people. And that's, that's kind of how, you know, that's, that's kind of how I feel that writing, writing is difficult. And, and uh, I'm just glad that, that, that it's done. Well, I've read both. And this one was certainly a more complex book to write. Um, you know, apart from the subject matter, I think uh, it's the sort of narrative weaves between, you know, memoir and history and goes back. It's not linear. It's, it's, uh, it's complex in its structure, and I think that must have been, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, been a challenge as well, apart from everything else. Uh, structurally, it was, it was it was definitely more complex because of the reasons that you say, because there, there were there were many different strands, and you know it went through many different drafts where you're sort of recalibrating the relative weight of each stra uh, yeah. of each uh, draft. So, like in an early version, there was much more actually about Orville and its history, much more of the kind of sociological strand. Uh, and then, you know, readers would say, well, I want more of Dion. And then actually working myself and Aurelis into it was a great challenge because that was a further strand that we had to. And, and as you right. said, it plays across time. Much of it happens in the past, but then you're you're always reminded of the fact that we are living in Oroville now. And the other thing I would say that's different is that I was reconstituting history through oral narrative, which is which is quite challenging. And so the, the research was was harder in some ways for this book. OK, so. What next for Akash Kapoor? I gather there's another book in the works. Ah, I was thinking of kind of crawling under my bed and reading for the rest of my life. <laughs> that would be that would be the desired fate. I there's a couple of projects kicking around. I think, you know, I think I have to make a choice, or somehow the choice has to be made on fiction versus nonfiction because I've oh. written two works of nonfiction. And this, this last work of nonfiction in particular, as you know, many people said, read like a novel and it, and it had a very st strong kind of narrative impulse. And so I have some ideas for a novel, yeah. but I also have some ideas for nonfiction. So I have two you know, documents now where I'm just sort of throwing, throwing notes into them and, and we'll see where it all nice. ends up. So we look forward to reading your novel. Um, thank you very much, Akash. Uh, lovely to speak to you as always. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Akash and Mukund, for an intriguing session. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. 
Stay tuned and hope to see you at the next session.